Good morning, or rather good afternoon. It's after one o'clock um, to all the Broad attendees. Um, I'm really delighted on behalf of the Stanley Center to uh, present to you Kariston Conan and also Christy Denkler and Kamal Choi, Kariston's colleagues from the Harvard Chan School of Public Health, uh, to give us a really timely seminar, seminar, the title of which is Resilience in Uncertain Times, flexible and mindful strategies to cope with coronavirus related stress. Uh, so thank you so much for the three of you to make time for this. And um, attendees, please use the Q&A box if you have questions. Kariston will be fielding those questions throughout the talk. So over to you, Kariston. Thanks so much. Thanks, Rosie. Um, thanks everyone who's joining us today. We're really delighted to be able to do this. Um, for those of you who um, I mean, I'm sure everyone here is familiar with the Stanley Center, but you know, at the Stanley Center and at the Broad, we focus on mental health. And so we decided to take a um, different approach today. And we'll be talking some about research, but the focus on, on, on in this talk will be on flexible and mindful strategies to deal with the current stress we're all facing. And um, I will just say a couple things about how we were inspired to do this. Um, a couple weeks ago, it actually turned out to be, I guess it's about two weeks ago, I sent out an email to my research group that we should have a conversation and during our normal lab meeting time about potential mental health effects of COVID-19. And the email got forwarded and what was supposed to be sort of a research group conversation, we had about 100 people who joined our Zoom call to talk about issues related to mental health stress and the current, that day was declared a pandemic. So that sort of motivated us to um, do more of these kind of forum where we will um, present and do some presentation and then really be here to answer questions um, and hopefully be of service to the community. So with that, I will, um, I guess we also wanna say that this is being recorded. Um, and so the recording will be available to folks and also the resources, the slides that are created and any other resources we have are publicly available and you can get that through, that, through our Google Drive. Um, and um, you know, feel free to use anything we have there for yourselves. And if you need to modify, you don't have to ask, just modify and use it for any communities you want. And with that, I will hand it over to Carmel. Great, thanks so much, Kirsten. Um, hi everyone, I'm Carmel and here with um, my colleague, Christy Denkla. Uh, we are both trained as clinical psychologists and we conduct research on genetics and epidemiology of stress and psychological resilience. And as members of the Broad, as Brodies, uh, we are grateful to the Broad Institute for the chance to share some of the most helpful things that we've been learning about stress and resilience, and also to discuss some best practices for coping during these uncertain times. So as a quick roadmap, this is what we'll cover today. Stress, understanding what it is and how to recognize it. Resilience, what this means and why it's possible. Coping, what is coping, what it's not, and how to cope flexibly. And then we'll also talk about some specific coping strategies um, for these times. And then we'll end hopefully with an open-ended discussion where we're excited to hear um, everyone's perspectives um, and questions. So according to psychologists, there are a couple universal ingredients that can make something stressful to us. And these ingredients include novelty, something new that you haven't seen or experienced before, threat, something that could actually be harmful or negative to you in some way, unpredictability, something that you don't exactly know if or when it will happen, and lack of control, something that you feel you have very little to no control over. And each one of these ingredients alone is enough to make us feel stressed. But what this current coronavirus outbreak worldwide has done is really bring all of these ingredients together um, so that they're happening all at once. So there's the virus, which is new, still a lot we don't understand about how it spreads, how it's contained, and a real possibility that we or our loved ones might get sick with it. And then there are the quarantines, not being able to leave home or do the things that we're used to doing. There are school and daycare closings. These are structures that families and students have been counting on that are suddenly gone. Jobs and savings on the line as doors close for the foreseeable future. Things selling out in stores. We hear shortage of medical supplies. 
and we read the news about things happening in the country and around the world, and we don't have very much control over it at all. So with all of this in mind, it makes a lot of sense that many of us are feeling stressed. And if you are feeling stressed, know that you are not alone. A quick Google search of coronavirus and stress brings up thousands and thousands of articles, and the search for information on this topic appears to be growing in popularity. So people are recognizing that they are feeling stressed and they want to do something about it. The first step to doing something about stress is recognizing when we are in fact stressed. So what are some of the key signs of stress? These can be divided into emotional signs, like feeling anxious, sad, irritable, or frustrated. Physical signs like changes in energy or appetite, eating less, eating more, not sleeping well, moving more slowly than usual. These include cognitive signs like thinking or worrying a lot, trouble concentrating or remembering or focusing on things. And behavioral signs, which might include withdrawing socially, being less productive, getting into arguments, taking risks that you normally don't take. So knowing these signs of stress and recognizing if and when they are happening can better prepare us for knowing when to use our coping strategies. Let's talk for a quick second though about the adaptive nature of stress. We often think that stress is bad, we should avoid or get rid of it. And this might lead to us actually feeling guilty or stressed about feeling stressed. And so an important thing to remember is that some stress and anxiety are actually good. Our brains were wired to pay attention to things that could be bad for us so that we could stay safe. And our bodies were designed to react in fight or flight mode so that we could get quickly out of tough situations, whether we're trying to run away from a tiger or avoid illness. So even now, being stressed, this is our brain and our body doing what they're supposed to do. They're trying to help and protect us. Evidence suggests that the effects just follow an inverted U-shape in many situations where some stress is actually good to keep us safe and alert and on our feet. Too little stress and then we fail to take action. While too much stress can get in the way of functioning and wear us down over time. So it's worth thinking about where you might be falling on this spectrum today as all of this is going on. So that's just some quick background about stress. And I'm gonna turn this over to Christy to talk a little bit now about resilience. Thank you, Carmel. Let me, let me just make sure everyone can see this. Um, everyone can hear me? Good. So, <clears throat> Um, so like Carmel said, um, some stress is adaptive and the observation that even under high stress and post-trauma circumstances, um, people seem to still thrive and do well um, has um, sort of piqued many people's interest in, in resilience and um, made us ask the question, what are the factors that are promoting resilience and why are people able to sort of bounce back or seem to maintain stable functioning even in the context of stress or trauma or um, even in the aftermath of experiencing exposure to trauma. This is a very salient <clears throat> sort of subject right now because as a global community we are experiencing sort of, I, I, I mean I, I would say almost unprecedented levels of stress and uncertainty. Um, at, at least that I can remember in, in my lifetime. So when we think about resilience, it's helpful to think about it in sort of three bins because it is a complicated term and um, it's very popular and, um, and used in many different contexts and sometimes uh, in a way that's, that, that's, that strays from the original sort of definition of it. So when we think about resilience, we can think about it in sort of three bins. The first bin is as a capacity. So these are sort of inborn traits that we can't necessarily change. 
And uh, there has been a, a lot of the bulk of research on resilience, I might suggest, has sort of fallen into this bin up to date. And these um, represent sort of inborn personality traits. We might even think of people. People might come to mind. We might think of ourselves. We might wonder how we got through that circumstance. I think sort of as a community at Stanley and at Broad, everyone has been exposed to stress. We've all been exposed to some sort of stress to have gotten to exam stress, work stress, uh, grant stress. I mean, this is a demanding environment. And so there are some sort of inborn traits that we uh, of, of a resilience that we bring to the table, to the circumstance. But we can't really change those. What we're going to focus on <clears throat> more today is talking about stress as a process. So the observation that, that we adapt to stress over time has, has given rise to a, a large bulk of very productive research to identify some of the productive, I mean, the protective and some of the um, buffering effects that help people cope and manage and even um, and, and show resilient outcomes in very high stress circumstances. So this is a, um, an image that uh, Carmel had, had, um, has developed in um, some, some publications. It's a very nice sort of image that represents these three bins of how we think about uh, resilience as a capacity, a process, and an outcome. The third bin um, is the outcome bin, and this is the bin that we also can't change very much. This is how people do after exposure to trauma or stress. So for the rest of the talk today, we're really going to focus in this middle section, which is the process. So when we follow people over time after exposure to a traumatic event, we learn that resilience is more the norm rather than the exception. Resilience isn't necessarily a superhuman trait. It's something that uh, is shared widely that everyone has and that when we look at large populations who have been exposed to a wide variety of traumatic stressors, we find that generally the bulk of people tend to display low symptom or high functioning trajectories over time. So resilience is a norm. Uh, we see it across several different types of trauma exposures. On the right hand side is a graph uh, following um, soldiers uh, who were deployed in combat situations, pre-deployment, follow-up, and after deployment. And we see that the bulk of this um, sample falls into this sort of stable low trajectory. This is a very high percentage, actually 83% is um, a very high proportion for generally what we see in this resilient category. Um, and, and it depends on the severity of the stressors. So for example, in circumstances like now, what we've seen from prior data on the SARS epidemic in Hong Kong for people who were actually um, hospitalized, the proportion of individuals in that sample who fell into the resilient category was far lower. It was about 40%. So, in very high contact, high um, stressor situations, there will be fewer people who show this stable low trajectory. But the same principle still holds is that the majority and the bulk of people will generally fall into the stable low trajectory. So when we think about some of the things that enhance and buffer resilience, the key to, I think, this whole process is flexibility. We've learned that flexibility is, um, is, is sort of a meta, meta concept in promoting uh, flexible and uh, promoting adaptation in the context of stress. So if we think about modulation of um, activation and deactivation in our sort of general attention energy levels throughout the day, these naturally rise and fall at a pace. Um, and at any point in this natural rise and fall an external stressor can occur. Uh, this can be um, news of family members, um, changes in work situations. We've been adapting to this on a daily basis for the past two weeks. Things have been changing um, enormously. And so the key to selecting um, the, 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 the coping strategy in that moment is having a flexible assessment of the impact of that selected strategy. So a stressor occurs, we select a coping strategy, and then we evaluate the effect of that coping strategy on the outcome, on, on how well that coping strategy did. And if it worked well, we maintain it. But if it didn't, we select another. So this is just to say that there's no one perfect coping strategy. There is no one superhuman approach to deploying resilient and buffering effects. Rather, it's the capacity to switch and alternate between different strategies as is appropriate for the situation that's really predictive of sort of adaptive outcomes. So with that, I'll turn it over to Carmel. Okay, so before we get to some specific coping strategies, let's quickly put coping into context with two framing ideas. 
The first idea is, what would we do if this was a crisis? These are extraordinary times. So when we hear the word crisis, our minds might jump to thinking about an emergency or a life-threatening situation. But in fact, dictionaries and psychologists define crisis more broadly as a time of intense difficulty or disruption, a time when usual patterns are breaking down, and a time when important changes are happening. And by that definition, for many of us, this is a crisis. This is a major disruption of life as we know it. And this is a hard and unusual situation. And in a crisis, we don't expect people to jump right into what they normally do, whether it's work or socializing or even coping. In a crisis, we tend to shift our expectations to simply getting through the day, getting through each moment. And so that might be as much as we can be expecting from ourselves and others right now. So it's great if you've already written three papers or created an online course, but it's also okay if you are just surviving. In a crisis, one of the most productive things that we know to do clinically is to stabilize. So stabilize first, and then we can figure out how to cope and move forward over time. And for this, even one predictable thing a day can be helpful as an anchor point for gaining stability during uncertain times. And these anchors might look like waking up at the same time every day, keeping a daily ritual like 9 a.m. coffee or 4 p.m. check-in with a loved one, making sure to eat three times a day, or repeating a favorite music playlist. Regardless of what this actually looks like for you, it's about giving yourself permission to prioritize the kind of structure that you find comforting for as long as this feels disruptive to you until things st feel stable again. For some people, this might take just a few days, and for other people, this can be an ongoing process. There is no timeline for this. So be kind to yourself and to others, because what we're going through here is not normal. Um, I read somewhere that um, we're not just working from home, but we're working from home during a pandemic. So this is unusual. And let's treat ourselves and others, you know, as if we were going through something challenging and disruptive. But when we are ready to think about coping, it can be hard sometimes to know where to start. And one helpful place is a classic framework that has been around for about 30 years um, that was initially developed by psychologists Lazarus and Folkman. And my group at Duke adapted this several years ago into a coping intervention for traumatic stress. And it goes something like this. So imagine for a second that all the stress that you are carrying today and this week is in this bag. And this feels and looks like one giant big thing to carry. But what makes this bag so heavy is really all the rocks or specific stressors that are contained inside. And so what can help first is to first take out everything that's inside, take out all the rocks and just see the whole collection of what's there. So I'm stressed about childcare, I'm stressed about getting sick or my parents getting sick or loved ones getting sick. I'm stressed about how my lab is gonna stay productive. I'm stressed about how to help. I'm stressed about the economy at large in the world, um, and so on. And then looking at each one, you can then decide, is this stressor something that is changeable or is it unchangeable? If something about this stressor is changeable, for example, the possibility of getting sick or getting others sick, then it makes sense to use a problem-focused strategy that tries to change the situation that's stressful. So for example, this might look like reading more about or following the CDC guidelines as close as possible, so taking action and trying to change the situation. But if the stressor is unchangeable for now, for example, I'm already doing all the hygiene and distancing practices that I can do, and I'm still feeling stressed about my health and others, then it makes more sense here to then switch to emotion-focused strategies that take care of how I feel even if I can't change anything about the situation. So for example, accepting that this is gonna to be tough or talking to someone about how I feel. And Chrissy will talk more about some of these specific strategies. The main idea here is really to take a look and identify what is most stressful right now 
to ask ourselves what is changeable, what is unchangeable, and then choosing coping strategies based on that. And Chrissy alluded to this, but this um, process does two things. The first thing is that it engages our thinking mind um, or the part of our brain um, at a time when the emotion part of our brain might be really activated. And there's actually good research to support that this shift can actually help us regulate our emotions effectively. And the second um, is that going through this process gives us flexibility in how we can cope. So instead of just doing one thing or only having one strategy that's a go-to, we know that we have choices and that we can change and adapt based on the situation. And so this flexibility is uh, key for resilience. So if this framework speaks to you, you it's something that you can go through um, and use anytime you're feeling stressed. Um, we'll put up a diagram in the Google Drive and make that available to everyone as well. Um, so with these coping principles in mind, let's turn now to talk about some specific strategies. So <clears throat> our goal here in kind of going over some of these specific strategies is to present a conceptual framework to hang these tips on. I think we have all been inundated with tips. We all probably have our own grab bag of tips. Um, there is like a flood of, 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 I don't know if anyone's seen the, the, tweet, the Twitter feed from the person who lived um, long-term in submarines. He gave his tips on how to survive quarantine. So there's some really great knowledge out there. Um, but especially in times of stress, our ability to process information slows. And so it can be difficult to integrate all these disparate pieces of tips into one cohesive network so that we can really deploy this flexibility that's such a core uh, factor in, in resilience. So our goal is to, like I said, kind of give this conceptual framework that we have um, two circumstances. We can have face stressors that are changeable and those that are not. And when we are facing stressors that we cannot change, um, we can not change the external event, but we can rather change something that we feel inside. So these are some examples of some things that are emotion-focused coping strategies. And they are, again, these ideas of things you can do to make you feel better despite the ongoing stress. Again, these are not actions that are going to change anything. They will only change our internal state. And these can be very effective when we are facing things that we cannot change. So some examples of this are mindfulness practice, um, a breathing practice, uh, humor, one of my favorites, um, titrating our media exposure, doing something fun, exercise distraction, drilling my draw. These are all sort of things in our grab bag of, of coping skills that I am sure every single Brody has, has uh, tried and, and uses well. The idea is that um, these are most helpful when they are matched with the stressor. So um, just, um, Advance. Okay, so in this vein, I would invite everyone to join me in an activity of belly or diaphragmatic breathing. Diaphragmatic breathing is one of the most powerful toolkits we have in our on hand. We can do it anytime. We take about 23,000 breaths a day. We can do this anytime, anywhere. Because breathing recruits, um, recruits physiological systems across the body, it's a very powerful tool to induce a relaxation response. This is an emotion-focused coping strategy. It is not going to change an external stressor. It will only change how we feel inside. But this is a very effective tool when we um, need um, a, 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 an intervention to reduce the amount of stress we're feeling. So I would, I'll lead us through a quick diaphragmatic breathing exercise. I would encourage everyone to do this with me because we can, you can hear me describe the rationale, but it's not until we actually experience it that we can really feel the full effects. So <clears throat> um, diaphragmatic breathing has been around for millennia. Um, if anyone has a yoga practice, they might also have a pranayama practice where um, they are various uh, ways of breathing to induce a sort of uh, a relaxation. The idea being that when we are, um, when our nervous system is, the, par the sympathetic nervous system is activated in a fight or flight situation, our breathing gets more shallow and it sort of resides in the chest. When our parasympathetic system, this rest and digest system is activated, our breathing gets much deeper and we breathe in through the belly. 
we will are all born with the capacity to breathe through our belly. If we look at babies or um, children sleeping, you'll see the belly rise and fall. And so that's what we want to stim simulate here. We want to be able to move our breath as we experience stress um, and as we um, live longer, we start to develop sort of chronic uh, short breathing patterns, sort of this thoracic bre breathing. And so it requires sort of um, uh, a intentional intervention to redirect our breathing down into the belly so that we can in, uh, initiate this cascade of parasympathetic nervous responses. So to do this, um, I like to put a hand on the chest and a hand on the belly because then I get some feedback on, on what is changing and uh, what's rising and falling. And um, just as a demo, the, what we want to experience, if you lean forward actually in your chair, you will feel the diaphragm just naturally because of the position has to rise and fall. And if you don't feel it, lean forward a bit more, it's actually quite remarkable. I, I didn't know this happened until recently, but this is the kind of experience that we want to have um, when we're sitting up. So that's just, it's, it can be hard to access from, a, um, from a, just initially. So this is, gives just a, us an idea of what we're going for here. So first, just start with, um, I like to close my eyes when I do this, um, but if you don't feel comfortable, you can just sort of uh, direct a soft gaze at a fixed point. And just start by noticing uh, what your hands are doing and what your breath is doing. Is your breath, um, do you feel it just sort of staying in, in the chest area? Is it going down into the belly? Maybe you're already feeling the belly rise and fall, which is great. And again, um, do a quick scan and just notice how you're feeling. This is a mindfulness practice as well. There's no judgment in this. You're just observing and noticing. So take a minute to do that scan. And then what we'll do is on the in-breath, you'll breathe in for the count to five. You'll count quietly inside your own mind. And you'll breathe in through the nose and count to five, deep breath. And then a gentle exhale, either through the nose or mouth. Take a normal breath now and just observe um, if you notice any movement on your hands and return to that deep breath in for a count of five. And that exhalation. And I'll have everyone do this for a cycle of five. So it'll be five in-breaths. Okay, very good. Excellent. So before you stop, just take another quick scan of your body. Notice any sensations. And you'll just name them, notice them, and then let them go. So <clears throat> I, um, this is another, uh, I love to do diaphragmatic breathing uh, personally. I also use it quite often in clinical settings where I treat um, PTSD and trauma. And um, this is an incredibly effective intervention. I have seen it carry people through um, some very difficult recoveries from severe trauma. And um, even in, the, in our day-to-day, -day, if we can practice this, it does take practice and it can be done in one or two minutes and it can be done anytime, anywhere, and can immediately induce this relaxation response. So that, again, just to summarize what we've talked about, we have this um, inborn capacity for resilience. Uh, no one is superhuman. And we have the flexibility, it's really the flexibility that's key, it's the capacity to sort of select an appropriate or a um, productive coping strategy that meets the needs of our, our environmental demands. In our tool bag, once we assess that we're having stressors, we assess the stress, we have a tool bag. And in that tool bag, we can have um, emotion-focused coping skills, which are not going to change the environment, but they will change how we feel inside. 
And then we also have problem focused coping. Now these are skill sets that we can deploy that are um, effective when the stressor is something we can control. So this is sort of exams, work demands. Um, we may know people come to mind who are incredible problem focused copers. Uh, we all have this skill as well. We all have to do it in order to sort of, um, we all to maintain a research career. So some of the examples of these are sort of setting achievable goals, making reasonable schedules, reaching out to friends for support, focusing on what you can change, stocking up on needed supplies, educating yourself on best safety practices, staying healthy, um, practicing good sleeping, uh, sleep hygiene. And um, one of the ones that I've recently experienced that I've uh, felt to be very powerful as a problem focused coping is engaging in volunteering or finding a way to serve. Um, sort of pulling, uh, working with Kirsten and the team and Carmel to pull this talk together and to provide some support to the community that has been um, very meaningful to me as a community, a source of support, friends, and um, this does goes a long way towards reducing um, sort of stress levels. Of course, there's the stress of actually having to do the presentation, but once that's overcome, there's a very um, long-term sort of beneficial um, effect. And this is different for everybody. It's different for the situation. It's different. Um, and I, and I, the last thing I want to say before I turn it over to questions is just that uh, being coping and being resilient doesn't have to be positive. It's not that this is not a superhuman deployment of like a skill set of excellent positive traits. Sometimes it's messy. Sometimes um, they're not necessarily what we might call positive behaviors. But the important thing is, is that we're flexible, is that we can evaluate the impact of that strategy on our environment and on our well being. And then we can either continue that or alter strategies. So this is really about being flexible and about being aware and mindful. And so on that note, I'll turn it over to the community for discussion and questions. Um, so thank you, Christy and Carmel. Um, that was a great presentation and um, thanks for taking the time to prepare it. It was very thoughtful. So we have a couple questions. So we encourage people to post questions via the Q&A. We actually have plenty of time for questions. Um, so I'll start with, um, um, and we, we will, uh, so someone posted, so we are going to distribute um, the link to the recording at the end of the talk. Um, I did post the, um, there, everything, all the presentations and all the materials and the recordings will be in the Google Drive. And so I posted that on the chat, but we can also um, distribute that. Um, so we had a couple questions. One, um, I did send the person that our handout, but advice, um, I'm thinking for children. So thoughts you have about about dealing with stress or some stress and resilience for families and those who are dealing with having kids at home. Um, and someone is specifically asked about children with ADHD or perhaps children with other clinical issues. I know that's sort of a big question. I know some of us are um, also dealing with having our kids <laughs> at home and not in school. So I thought you might have something to share on that. <laughs> Um, I, I, I think, you know, I've actually noticed, um, my own children who, um, you know, are, they're, they're, they're just sort of all over the place. They are, um, you know, this is, this is part of an effect of stress. Stress sort of exacerbates, um, a short attention span, especially with children. I don't know what age the children are. So mine are three and, and five, but, um, the children may not be able to speak about the stress, but they will be able to demonstrate that they are stressed very clearly. And so when these things happen against the context of sort of a clinical, um, a clinical situation or an existing clinical diagnosis, these, uh, it can, it, these things can be exacerbated. Um, this, uh, I wish I had a um, really specific um, cure or amazing suggestion. Um, I think that the I the best thing I could probably do, which would be suggest might be in line with this talk, which is to be kind to yourself, be patient, and um, try different things. Um, be flexible. Uh, children can surprise us. I, I I think sometimes with their creativity and their capacity to problem solve. I think um, 
children now do need an outlet to find a way to express um, some of their reactions and some of the questions, some of the things they're struggling with. And again, this is sort of developmentally different, depends um, on the age. I don't know, Kirsten, if you've noticed <clears throat> um, any sort of, or if, um, any particular patterns of like signs that there might be stress going on that aren't necessarily being verbalized or discussed directly. Yeah, so um, we have in the um, in the Google Drive, we did a presentation at Harvard School of Public Health last week on, um, on well, it's called Mindful Parenting. Um, it's And so people ask me, and I will say it is um, not something I'm very good at myself, but it was a good presentation given by our colleague. Um, and um, there's, and so that's in there, the recording and the handout. Um, and it goes through, um, the handout does go through different ages. So my son's 12, and I will say that um, his, his um, kids do tend to be worried about things that affect them directly the most, and that's what you might articulate. And I, as a parent, I can sometimes get frustrated because I feel like my child is worried about something that's silly. And I'm like, the world is going crazy, and you're worried about, like, I don't have the right cheese for your quesadilla or something. Um, but um, I do find that, um, and so my son's 12, and so his, a lot of his preoccupation has been, like, uh, when school was canceled, what about our homework? Is the homework going to be due? Is it going to be graded? And now they've given work. And so it seems, tends to be very focused on that and around his friends. So I think it is pretty particular. I don't have any magic except for that. Um, I feel like my son's dealing with it better than I am, actually. He's been more flexible. <laughs> than <I am. laughs> um, Another question was um, around, uh, this was interesting, give your thoughts. I don't have any brilliant answers to this myself, but um, someone mentioned um, about people with clinical OCD um, whose sort of maybe some of their symptoms or their OCD uh, behaviors <clears throat> are sort of matching with some of the things that we're supposed to be doing now, like hand washing and mm -hmm. maybe checking and not leaving the house and staying distant. Um, and so I know this is kind of a challenging question and we're not giving people specific clinical advice, but I wondered if either of you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, I'm happy to take a first stab at it. Um, so obviously, you know, this stressful situation affects us all, but those who have sort of pre-existing, you know, concerns and challenges and mental health um, conditions um, might be particularly sort of affected during this time and especially when it comes to OCD there is the sort of checking and the sometimes the sort of um, hygiene uh, behaviors that can sort of overlap with a lot of what's being recommended right now which is like a lot of hand washing um, and sort of avoiding germs and uh, being aware of infection um, so obviously you know we can't provide clinical advice but and there are um, very good resources available online uh, like via the International OCD Foundation that have been developed specifically around um, sort of managing OCD in the in a time of a coronavirus outbreak so I, I would recommend sort of reading more online about that. Um, but some of the tips that they do uh, provide um, include um, around working and sort of feeling like the need to check and know, especially when it comes to media, um, really trying to be mindful that that will be um, something that's happening and setting a defined time for using media um, without having to sort of learn everything that you need to know about the situation. Um, another one is, um, really trying to strike that balance with following the public health guidelines. So like washing as much as is recommended by the CDC, um, but really trying not to s go beyond that. Um, and so giving yourself permission to sort of do more than maybe, you know, you might have been working with a, a clinician on doing, um, but just risk, um, sort of aligning yourself with those guidelines and giving yourself permission to do that. Um, and then you know, if, if someone is already involved with the treatment team, sort of reaching out to them if, you know, more support is needed during this time, because it is, it is a time of heightened, you know, vulnerability and just, yeah, stress and anxiety for all. That's great. Thank you, Carmel. Another question, um, so I'll, I'm going to, I'm going to come back to a question, Carmel and Christy, um, where people are asking how to how to deal with um, stress from isolation physically and loneliness. So I'll give you a minute to think about that. Someone has asked about something that I have a lot of experience with, which is waking up in the middle of the night. Um, so falling asleep well, this is, describes me exactly. And so I wanted to share, um, I can share some things that 
that you know sort of evidence-based things people recommend and then my own strategies so um, if you're someone who falls asleep okay um, or have your sort of nighttime routine that allows you to relax and fall asleep but wake up in the middle of the night some of the things you can look at are um, your so on the on the food and drinking side alcohol intake alcohol can make us tired but it does disrupt sleep um, as do things like um, ben, Benadryl or taking antihistamines or anything like that you might be taking to sleep that can result in being able to fall asleep and but waking up or having um, disrupted sleep. Um, another thing is um, blood sugar changes for some people can disrupt sleep in the night so um, or having to go to the bathroom so watch what you're drinking before you go to bed and then also sometimes actually having like some kind of snack before you go to sleep can help sleep stay through the night um, as well as trying to get exercise although that's you know hard during it, it trying to get outside and do exercise even though the gyms and things are closed right now um, the things that I find helpful when I do wake up in the middle of the night um, people will tell you um, to not stay in bed tossing and turning get up and do something boring that so if you find reading um, enables you to relax Maybe go, if you can go to the couch and read and then go back to bed when you're tired. Um, I personally find that that doesn't work as well for me. So the things that have worked for me are really boring podcasts. So not like um, Pod Save America or anything that's going to get you all riled politically or anything in the news, but um, books on tape that are like nonfiction. So one, that book, it's a great book, but has worked for me is Guns, Germs, and Steel. Um, and then the other thing I recommend is I use something called Insight Timer. It's a free app. Um, it has really great sleep meditations under the sleep button. And there's a whole bunch and I set my phone. So one thing you have to be careful is not to check your phone in the middle of the night, but I set my phone, I set it on a sleep meditation. And then if I wake up, I put it on and they have all different lengths. And so that kind of works. So I don't know if Christy or Camille, you have other things for people waking up in the middle of the night. And then we can go to stress and loneliness. Yeah, I, Kirsten, you were, I, I, in, in disclosure, I also woke up in the middle of the night last night and <laughs> had a very hard time getting back to sleep. So I sort of go through these, the, the Rolodex of like, you know, things we can do, all of which you mentioned, sometimes they stick and sometimes they don't. So I think it's good to have sort of a, <clears throat> you know, a big, a grab bag of things that we can use. Um, I'm very, I've always been very interested in self-distancing. I don't know if anyone's followed this research, but it's, um, Ethan Cross has done a lot of these really great experimental studies looking at the adaptive effects of being able to take some mental distance from our identity. So <clears throat> for example, um, uh, actually there's a supposed to be, I think it's, I, it's a, I don't know if it's Kobe Bryant, but there's a YouTube video of a very famous basketball player speaking to himself, getting ready before a game. And he's like speaking to himself by his first name. I, uh, so he's, you know, so I would say, you know, Christy, uh, Christy, you can get back to sleep. Christy, you're gonna, so speaking to ourselves from giving ourselves <laughs> mental distance, from being immersed in a painful experience can also can, can kind of help induce um, a capacity to sort of self-soothe and relax. And actually somehow miraculously last night, this, this worked for me. So, um, it, you know, um, so that's like just another uh, personal strategy. There are some experimental evidence. So I just throw that out there because it was salient given the question and what happened last night. I don't know, Carmel, if you have others. Yeah, that's awesome, Christy. Um, no, I think you guys um, really summarized a lot of great strategies there. I would say also, um, you know, tried and true like sleep hygiene principles, um, you know, can, you can sort of find those online, but like, you know, if you find yourself waking up in the middle of the night and then tossing and turning for like a couple hours, then the bed can sort of become like a place where you feel like, you know, I'm not going to sleep. I'm just feeling restless. And so, um, oftentimes it's recommended that if you sort of are tossing and turning, um, and can't get back to sleep to actually sort of physically get out of bed, um, and like sort of be in another room or even like sit in a chair. Um, so that way for you, the bed still remains a place where you sort of get good rest. Um, so when you're sort of finally tired, you know, maybe doing other things, reading or listening to something, then you can sort of, um, Go back to bed and that might be just some something else to try but i think the thing highlighted here is just um you know having a bunch of different strategies that you can sort of use and um use them flexibly and um one so of the i can I yeah i forgot to mention was and then the other thing is um 
it's okay if you don't sleep. Like it's okay. I mean, sleep is incredibly important and we can do all these things, but also one thing I work on myself is just to tell myself, you know what, it's okay. So I'm tired. It's okay. Um, because we can also feel like, oh my God, I can get myself, you know, all worked up. Oh my God, I can't sleep. It's going to be horrible. So, mm -hmm. you know, um, it's also okay if you don't sleep, yeah. um, mm -hmm. that, you know, to, to be gentle with yourself, especially during this time when there's so much disruption. And um, many of us, like right now, I'm actually doing this webinar on my bed, which is terrible sleep hygiene, but I have no place <laughs> quiet in my apartment to do it. So this is it. Otherwise, my son would be bothering us. Um, a lot of people have asked about stress, like loneliness and dealing with physical isolation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, obviously we have to sort of stay away <coughs> physically and we're recommended um, to keep six feet away from each other. But um, I think that this time has really highlighted that there are still so many ways that we can reach out um, in this day and age, especially. Um, so even though we might sort of be at home or not, you know, not be interacting as much um, in the office or in the lab, um, you know, there are are many virtual ways to sort of connect, whether calling someone or texting, using Zoom chat rooms. Um, I've heard of some labs, you know, doing virtual happy hours um, and lunches um, and just finding ways um, that are non-traditional to connect. Um, and if, you know, you're not part of a group that is already doing that, you know, reaching out to some people um, that you like or that you work with um, and you know saying like hey why don't we why don't we try that um, that might be a way to sort of s start to break some of that isolation Christy any other ideas yeah I, th I think that's such a good question something we're all every single person is grappling with and I remember Kirsten two weeks ago when we started to put um, some of these resources together one of the things we first realized was like was that loneliness and isolation is a stressor and a risk factor and it increases um, risk for declining sort of or um, declining mental health. We know this, we know even in, especially in trauma research, social support is just so important and is such a key um, buffer. So we had a lot of concern um, from the beginning about how the loneliness and isolation is going to affect um, our mental health. <clears throat> and I think um probably the reality is it will there's that's that's just reality and as carmel said we are in a fortunate era when there is um a lot of online um, capacity to connect online and um i don't think we're used to spending this much time alone and um the other thing is if um sometimes we're not alone but we are um in stuck with family members who <laughs> if you want who we love maybe need a bit of space from sometime and we can't always get that space so i think the social sort of consequences of this um, physical dis uh, distancing is, is 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 having ripple effects and will continue to um yeah i mean just some things i've done um uh is I'm very into yoga, as people know me know, and I've been doing as many, I've been trying to connect with live stream yoga, and um, I'm actually doing classes at my old studio when I lived in New York City, um, and that's been really neat because it's enabled me to connect with people, and it just somehow doing the live stream Zoom feels better, feels more connected, so, um, and like I said, other people doing, um, yeah, like people said, doing happy hours or trying to figure out ways um, to connect. Um, the other thing that I think has motivated all of us is if you can figure out something you can do for someone else, it can make you feel better. So I heard of things in some apartment buildings, even things like when you're ordering stuff, like ordering stuff for neighbors and having it left outside and things like that. I mean, we have such smart people in this community. I'm sure people could think of things that I'm not even thinking of. Um, Can I jump in? Sorry, I, I know yeah, I'm uh, not ahead. technically yeah, a, a presenter, but I was just here to present <laughs> to you guys, but I'm listening to this and it's reminding me that in my neighborhood, there's a lot of kids and either on Nextdoor or on Facebook or on an email group, people are suggesting things to put in windows. Uh, so a teddy bear in the window or can everybody on Friday put a rainbow in their window so that when the kids go around the neighborhood for walks, they spot all the rainbows, see how many different animals they can spot. And you can wave to your neighbors out out of the window and it's just so great having that connection mm -hmm. yeah, that's I, 
Yeah. I will, I, I will add even um, what, what a, how much a smile makes uh, that, you know, there's some very lovely research showing that, you know, all the centers of our brain that are, you know, activated light up just with a smile. And so a, a passing smile from a stranger can have, have such a positive effect. Um, and then I'm, I'm also noticed what's been interesting about this is I've connected with people that I wouldn't normally have connected with. So I'm sort of chatting with an uncle that I have who lives in Italy and we're exchanging recipes just to check in. What are you having for dinner tonight? Um, I, we've, and I've, I've found this um, with friends. Uh, so sort of we're, we're um, a lot of my friends that I haven't spoken to in a long time are, are reconnecting and having Zoom chats or I'm getting together um, with a group like WhatsApp chats. And so it's actually been um, an unexpected, you know, um, uh, byproduct. It's been very pleasant of, of, of this, um, of the sort of restricted day-to-day uh, -day socializing. Another <clears throat> question, uh, a couple of people have asked different versions of this are, um, any tips for when previous maladaptive thoughts or way to, way to, ways to cope are exacerbated during this time? And um, one person mentioned eating disorder behaviors. Um, I think there could be a whole range of behaviors, um, whether it's, um, you know, substance use or, you know, really binge eating or anything could be um, or triggered by stress. And what, what, you know, suggestions do you have, if any? Yeah, I think this is a great question. And I think it reflects awareness on the part of those who ask the question about, you know, sort of like um, that there might be that um, sort of pull or tendency to go back into sort of things that um, we know aren't necessarily helpful or healthy. Um, and I think that the start would be to sort of recognize like what are the sort of the warning signs or the the triggers for going back um, to those uh, behaviors or strategies. Um, so at the beginning of this uh, presentation, we talked about, you know, signs of stress. And oftentimes we sort of use um, unhealthy strategies, you know, to, to get rid of feeling bad or feeling stressed. And um, the sooner that we can catch ourselves when we're sort of feeling um, uncomfortable or stressed or anxious and really sort of that and turning sort of like a kind of, and then trying to sort of think through like what are some of the other ways of dealing with that and sort of being gentle uh, with myself as I you know try to cope with um, feeling like afraid or nervous um, that um, might be one way to sort of sub out the the usual go-to strategies for something um, that else that you can choose at this time. Um, so yeah, knowing your triggers, knowing the signs of stress and sort of even in, in advance planning out some alternatives about what you might want to do instead. Um, so we, we shared some ideas here of emotion focused strategies, problem focused strategies. There's a lot more other sort of tips online, but maybe, maybe making a list of the ones that sort of feel good for you. Um, and that if, you know, you feel inclined to go back into sort of drinking or, um, you know, doing something else that um, you know is not usually helpful for you, um, having some alternatives on hand that you're ready to use. Any other suggestions? And I guess I mean, Carmel have said this, I would just think about, I, I would look online to see what supports are available. Um, we're working in our Google Drive with a lot of different supports, but I've actually been really astounded by the number of different I mean, sort of AA trying to figure out how to do this online and a lot of different groups. So there may be things mm -hmm. that you would have access to that um, that we're not mm -hmm. aware of. So I would definitely um, look into that because it does feel like people are stepping up to try to create these opportunities. Yeah, always mm -hmm. reach out. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so a question for uh, Christy um, <clears throat> um, was, um, thinking about uh, bereavements, um, and I'll just read this. Um, it was in the time of you know, people getting sick or dying, it, we might have to think about um, saying goodbye to loved ones differently. Um, and the person who posted this also you know, said that they had to deal with this um, personally and that um, we, Christy, I know, I know you've been thinking a lot about this, so. Mm -hmm. uh, we have, we've been, um, and Rosie also, and um, I know, um, understand Ben has been also thinking about this and we um, we're developing some resources we've developed a handout that um, we can distribute we're working with um, Kathy Shear at the Center for Complicated Grief who has just really been sort of she's just a powerhouse in the clinical treatment of grief 
And there's some really lovely resources there. We are planning a forum on um, uh, for Harvard School of Public Health in two weeks um, to address this. Um, so in, in, in a nutshell, um, I, I think this is just um, a, an enormously um, unusual and um, uh, difficult and stressful situation we are going to be facing. One of the things that we do when we uh, to mark a person's loss or to mark a death is to gather in a funeral setting, and this is such an important um, uh, part of the grieving process to acknowledge the death, to mourn together, to gather. And in these circumstances, we're not going to be able to do that. As as you mentioned, we're also probably in some cases not going to be able to say goodbye to loved ones who are in quarantine. The the thing that immediately comes to mind in this circumstance is to try and think ahead and have a plan in place if that's at all possible. It's a bit macabre, but it is um, it is a way of, it's a problem-focused strategy of dealing with the stress of making sure loved ones have iPads, making sure like our grandparents can get on Zoom or um, WhatsApp or chat or elderly or vulnerable people have the technology so that we can speak with them so that we can stay in touch. Reach out to those you love, tell them you love them, stay connected. Um, and there are um, already online uh, funerals are happening virtually. So that is a possibility for some of us that we may be facing that. Um, so right now, I think we're sort of um, not sure how this is going to play out. And we do know, though, that in some cases, we won't be able to say goodbye, we will not be able to gather in person. And so given that reality, it's worth having maybe a few contingency plans in place. This is not the same question, but along these lines, a number of people have asked um, about um, <laughs> advice in um, supporting, uh, you know, fam uh, elderly family members who don't live close by, um, and um, dealing with elderly parents and worrying about getting infected, um, and whether they're that can be an issue if they're close by or far away. There's different issues if they're close, and you, you whether you should go see them or not. Um, and um, also maybe, um, yeah, so that's an elderly, an elderly, an elderly people who are limited with technology and crave some physical contact. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, with regards to, so there are multiple components of this. Um, one is sort of like worrying from afar about our elderly parents. Um, and it, here, you know, I, I heard that like there's kind of a reversal where we're yelling at our parents now for going out um, or and worrying about them. Um, so it's kind of, you know, strange times that we're in. Um, in some scenarios, like, in, you know, if, if parents are open to sort of, you know, advice or like, you know, there might be some ways to sort of work with them to sort of come up with a plan. But oftentimes it's sort of like this is something that we are just worried about from afar. Um, and that's something that's really um, uncomfortable um, to sit with. And we can reach out to them and sort of connect as much as we can and check to see how they're doing. But at some point, we sort of can't. Just one quick last question, if um, any of you have thoughts on this, is around um, physical touch for people who are socially isolated by themselves. You know, right now, with those with pets are finding, you know, their pets to be a source of comfort um, and, you know, tactile touch. But for those without pets, you know, and without people around, um, that is that is a challenge. Um, I think there's a lot that can be done with regards to sort of self-soothing. So folks who, um, you know, there are strategies for calming down with using like weighted blankets or taking like a hot shower, sort of grounding yourself in five senses, even if it's sort of maybe for now not being able to sort of reach out and touch someone else's hand or shoulder, but um, taking time to care for your own physical senses um, and sort of use things that are grounding um, and soothing physically um, might be a way to do that right now when we can't access other ways of touch. Yeah, I was just gonna plug the, um... Uh, the other thing people people who have the, have the, the access to um, even something like we might not normally do like take a bath because we want to have you know normally we don't have time and we're like running out of the house or like 
uh, people do find the weighted blankets. Again, it's not the same, but it is something that um, some people also have pe people more like, I don't know evidence for this, but people do report finding weighted blankets is very helpful for sleeping. Mm -hmm. So um, you can find various ones on Amazon. Um, so it's a plug for those. Um, another question was about, um, do you have advice for loved ones who might be experiencing stress from media consumption? Um, so that could be, I guess, loved ones or could be any of us. Um, how to deal with that, that kind of, you know, wanting to be informed in some ways needing to be informed, but yes, yes, having stress, finding it stressful. I think this depends on how you are getting your news. So some people are scrolling Twitter a lot and sort of, you know, there's a lot of emergent you know, news that comes up through the Twitter feeds. And um, for myself and others, it's been helpful to sort of only access it like on one, like on a computer as opposed to on a phone where you can sort of scroll endlessly and get sort of sucked into the vortex of all the negative news. So really putting a time limit on that um, and changing where you read your news um, so that you don't sort of get to sort of scroll indefinitely um, is something that people have told me is really helpful. And I've also experienced that as well. Christy, any ideas? No, I, <clears throat> I don't know if there's ever been a time in my lifetime, I can remember there's been such a unification of headlines across all media platforms. It's nearly impossible to um, engage with any media without um, some information about this pandemic. And so um, I, the other day, I, the other, I was doing something and somehow I just didn't, I was busy during the day and I didn't check in the whole day on media and I had forgotten about it. And it was such a refreshing um, experience to realize that I hadn't for the last, whatever it was, six hours actually um, dipped into any news or been aware. I think um, the best advice we could probably give is to take a break um, from it. Um, unfortunately, that might conflict with many of our jobs for those of us who are involved um, in leading now or doing um, research in this area. Um, but if we can to titrate exposure, I think we, we um, in some sense, um, can take a break for a few hours <clears throat> and expect things not to have changed, <laughs> unfortunately, that much. Well, great. I think um, I've got a, a notice. I think we have to wrap up um, now. But um, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, and thanks for Christy and Carmel and um, Rosie and for initiating us doing this for the Broad. Um, and we'd be happy to do more of these on different topics in the future if people have found this useful. So let us know. Um, like I said, the, the recording and everything will be available in the Google Drive um, and as well as handouts and slides and everything. Um, thanks so much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Karisten, from all of us at Broad. And there were other questions that didn't get answered. Yeah. If there are ways to incorporate those um, answers into some of your materials, that would be terrific as well. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Thank, Great you. Questions. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.